Hi everyone. We are well aware that in the history of nuclear disasters, there have been events that have touched us closely and left an indelible memory. Who doesn't remember Chernobyl or the most recent Fukushima, at least by hearsay? In the history of nuclear accidents, there is one event occurred in Japan in 1999 that I think would be unknown to most people. I'm talking about the Tokaimura accident. The town of Tokaimura, with its almost 38,000 inhabitants, is located in the Ibaraki prefecture and is approximately 70 miles north away from Tokyo. This town is often referred to as the art of Japanese nuclear industry. The Japan Atomic Energy Research Institute was founded here in 1956. The town later housed nuclear fuel factories, reprocessing plants and Japan's first nuclear power plant. The Japan Nuclear Fuel Conversion Company was built here and in 1998 the company was renamed as JCO Co Ltd. At the time of the accident, JCO was involved in the production of fuel for nuclear fission plants, reprocessing spent fuel, I mean the one already used in some nuclear plants, or by enriching mined uranium. Three uranium conversion facilities operated at this plant, two of which produced up to 715 tons per year of less than 5% enriched uranium for conventional nuclear power plants. The third facility, for the record, the one where the accident occurred, was authorized to produce and purify powder triuranium octoxide and uranyl nitrate to enrich uranium up to the 20%. In 1984, this facility, called Conversion Test Building CTB, had been authorized to produce not more than 3 tons of enriched uranium per year. To consider that its cumulative use was limited to about 2 months a year, this because the production was limited to small batches on average of 100 kilos, mainly required for the experimental breeder nuclear plant Joyo, which needed small quantities of uranium as required to regenerate the fission depleted fuel within its core. The interest in uranium enrichment lies in the fact that natural uranium is composed of a mixture of three isotopes, uranium-234, uranium-235 and uranium-238. You can see from the pie chart that uranium-238 is the most abundant, 99.3%. Uranium-235 is around 0.72%, while Uranium-234 is a negligible percentage. To obtain a nuclear fuel with a high probability of fission, and which in turn at its fission emits enough neutrons to bombard other atoms, generating and sustaining a chain reaction, we need more uranium-235, that's why enrichment is done. The enrichment of uranium takes place through systems that separate its isotopes. In this way, it is possible to collect and therefore increase the concentration of uranium-235 with respect to the abundant uranium-238. In practice, when it is possible to increase the percentage of uranium-235, typically to values between 3 and 5%, the characteristic fissile material for nuclear reactors is obtained. But let's go back to the day of the accident. Operations were underway at the conversion building to produce an 18.8% enriched uranium nitrate solution to be employed at the Joyo Experimental Reactor. The procedure, approved by the government in 1984 and called Sumitomo Adu, required workers to pour the uranium powder with added nitric acid into a dissolving tank. 
This stage was very crucial, because downstream of the dissolving tank, there were various intermediate stages for the extraction of impurities for the uranyl nitrate generated from the previous mix. In addition, there were two buffer tanks whose tall and narrow geometry was designed to contain the solution safely and to prevent critical tip. Finally, there was a system controlling and regulating the introduction of uranyl nitrate into the precipitation centrifuge at the right amount. That is 2.4 kg of uranyl nitrate. The importance of this value is linked to the fact that fissile materials such as uranium have a critical mass. In practice, if the mass quantity exceeds given levels, a chain reaction is created, which is controlled in nuclear power plants, but it is not certainly controlled in an enrichment centrifuge. Finally, depending on the request, the uranyl nitrate could be undergone to calcification by means of a furnace to produce purified triuranium oxide. When uranium dioxide was requested, the reduction of triuranium octoxide was carried out in furnace and finally, if the request was to supply pure uranyl nitrate, pure triuranium octoxide was dissolved again in the dissolving tank, repeating the procedure until purity was reached at the desired level. In 1995, in violation of the operating manual, JCO changed the procedure without any authorization, allowing its technician to dissolve uranium oxide and nitric acid directly in 10 liter stainless steel buckets to then be pumped into the intermediate stages. This speeded up the procedure and in any case was safe, because the entry still took place upstream of the safety systems. The final and fatal change to the procedure occurred just the day before the accident. On September 29, in 1999, the operation to produce uranyl nitrate solution began and was carried out by three JCO technicians, Isashi Ouki, Masato Shinohara and Yutaka Yokokawa. For reasons of time, and to speed up the procedure, it was decided to empty the buckets of uranyl nitrate directly into the separation centrifuge, effectively skipping the buffer tanks. The process continued into the following morning, and three more buckets were poured. At 10.35 am, a quantity of about 16.6 kg of uranium was reached in a container which, by law, had to contain a maximum of 2.4 kg. This action instantly created a critical mass. The fission reaction became self-sustaining, emitting gamma rays and neutrons. At that moment, a blue flash was observed by the technicians, possibly Cherenkov radiation, and the alarms of the radiation monitor sounded. The holding tank had become a nuclear reactor exposed to the air, and its water cooling system represented a good reflector of neutrons, which, in that way, had an even better chance of hitting other nuclei, self-sustaining the reaction. At the time of the event, Isashi Ouki had his body draped over the centrifuge tank, holding the funnel, while Masato Shinohara stood on a platform to assist in pouring the buckets of uranyl nitrate. Yutaka Yokokawa was sitting at a desk in an office four meters away. The three technicians evacuated the building, and, at 10.43 am, the emergency services were called, who arrived at 10.46, without however being aware of the nature of the accident and without personal dosimeters. Later, it turned out that the rescuers also received a fair dose of radiation. 
a total of 123 workers were present at D. And, analyzing their dosimeters, the actual dose accumulated by some of them ranged from 0.1 to 6.2 millisievert. At 11.40 am, some gamma radiation detectors measured a dose of 0.84 millisievert per hour, respectively at points 4, 13 and 14 on the map. The neutron peak outside the complex occurred after 5 pm at points A and B. At 3 pm, the mayor of Tokaimura decided to evacuate the residents within a 350 meter radius from the JCO. And by 10 past 8 pm, 161 people had been evacuated. At 10.30 p.m., Ibaraki Prefecture ordered residents within 10 km to stay indoors and not to eat any vegetables from their vegetable gardens. In the hours following the accident, the fission reaction produced continuous chain reactions. Therefore, JCO organized teams to drain the cooling water of the separation centrifuge in order to decrease the number of fissions inside it. The initiative to remove the cooling water began at 2.30 am of October 1 by pumping in argon gas and venting water from a pipe just outside the conversion building. Afterwards, a neutron-absorbing boric acid solution was injected into the separation centrifuge. This intervention was successfully completed at 8.30 am, thus ending the fission of the material. 21 people were engaged in water drainage, who were exposed to doses from 0.04 to 119 millisievert. Six people were employed in the activity of pouring boric acid into the precipitation tank, exposing themselves to doses from 0.03 to 0.61 millisievert. The three technicians were first taken to the Mito National Hospital, then by helicopter to the National Institute of Rheological Science, NIRS, in Chiba. Isashi Ouki, 35 years old, who had been undergone to the greatest radiation exposure, estimated between 16 and 20 sievert, was transported and treated at the University of Tokyo Hospital. Although Ouki only had skin redness and swelling on his right hand and forearm in the early hours, he had suffered severe radiation damages. The enormous amount of radiation he was exposed to destroyed all his chromosomes and he had a near zero white blood cell count. Doctors attempted to restore some functionality to Ouki's immune system by administering blood stem cell transplantation, which was received from his sister. This operation, however, was useless. Numerous other interventions were conducted in an attempt to arrest further decline of Ouki's severely damaged body, including repeated use of cultured skin grafts and pharmacological interventions with painkillers, without any measurable success. At the wishes of his family, doctors repeatedly revived Ouki, even as it became clear the damage his body had sustained through radiation was untreatable. Ouki died on the 21st of December in 1999, following a cardiac arrest. Masato Shinohara, 39 years old, received between 6 and 10 sieverts and suffered the same fate as Ouki, but with a longer course. Despite a seven-month battle, Shinohara was unable to fight radiation-induced infections and internal bleeding, and died on April the 27th in 2000. The technician supervisor Yutaka Yokokawa, 54 years old, was exposed to a dose between 1 and 4 sievert. He received treatment from the NIRS in Chiba, he was released three months later. 
the Tokaimura accident has been classified by the Japanese authorities as level 4 on the IAEA International Nuclear Event Scale, INES, indicating an event with, with no significant off-site risk. In April 2001, six employees, including the chief of the production department at the time, pleaded guilty to a charge of negligence. Among those arrested was Yokokawa for his failure to supervise proper procedures. The JCO president also pleaded guilty on behalf of the company. During the trial, the jury learned that a 1995 JCO safety committee had approved the use of steel buckets in the uranium enrichment procedure. As a result of this, JCO's license to produce nuclear fuel was withdrawn, and JCO was forced to compensate both area residents and farmers, paying out astronomical amounts of money, more than 12.73 billion yen to citizens and 4.5 billion yen to farmers. It was the worst industrial nuclear accident in Japan prior to the Fukushima disaster.